So good evening and welcome to the Beef Cattle Research Council's webinar on hormone use in beef cattle. My name is Stacey Domalewski. I am the Extension Assistant with the Beef Cattle Research Council and I'll be your moderator tonight. The session is going to last for approximately one hour but may go a little longer depending on the questions asked during the question and answer period. If you're on Twitter, please tweet along with us using hashtag beefwebinar. We are recording this session and I will email out the link to the recording to everyone that's registered within the next couple of days. So if you miss hearing anything tonight, you can watch it again later. Um, I also encourage you to take some notes as well and you can look up anything and that will help you remember some of the things that we talk about tonight. Of course, for the webinar tonight, you'll be able to hear and see tonight's presenter, but we can't hear or see you. So if you do want to communicate with us, type into the small chat window in the control panel on the side of your screen. Um, if you have a question or comment for me or any of the presenters tonight, that's the place to do it. And feel free to send in your questions at any time and we'll answer them at the end of the hour. If your internet connection is being a bit slow tonight, it might help to close the webcam window. This means you won't be able to see the presenters, but it may help to make the audio come through a little clearer and get the slides to load a bit faster. So, all right, let's get started. So here is the agenda for tonight's webinar. We'll start with Tom Lichstotten. He's the issue manager for the Canadian Cattlemen's Association, and he'll be talking a little bit about his position there. Next, we'll move on to Dr. Reynold Bergen, who will be talking about hormone use in cattle. We'll open it up to any questions from you and leave it with some information that you may find valuable on your farm or ranch. But before we get things going, I would like to introduce Tracy Herbert. She's the Beef Extension Specialist with the Beef Cattle Research Council, and she has a special announcement tonight. Well, hi, everybody. So glad that you could join us tonight. Um, so yeah, so as Stacy mentioned, I am here with an exciting announcement. Something that's been a long time coming uh, that people in the industry are really looking forward to and something that you can enjoy and get a lot of value out of. And that is the first ever Canadian Beef Industry Conference. So there has never been one uh, before, so for the first time, four of the national beef industry organizations are joining forces to host this event that will bring people who have a stake in all of the different sectors of the uh, Canadian beef industry together under one roof. So it'll move around the country each year, but it is kicking off August 9th to 11th in Calgary, Alberta. So what are you going to find when you come to the Canadian Beef Industry Conference? So one of the features will be producer-focused workshops and sessions about how together all of us with a stake in this industry can and will increase the value of our carcasses. We'll talk about how to improve our industry's competitive edge. So things like getting a regulatory system that supports the industry without any uh, unnecessary burden or costs. We'll talk about connectivity and enhancing the synergies within our industry, so we're not working in silos, so to speak. And then also connecting with people outside of our industry, so connecting positively with consumers, the public, government, and our partner industries. And of course, productivity. So making sure that producers like yourselves are able to make informed decisions for your operation. So, for example, learning about breeding or management decisions that will get us, you know, lots of healthy calves on the ground that perform well in the feedlot and grade well at the packers. So you'll see keynote presentations followed by practical workshops where you'll hear innovative ideas and learn about new technologies, uh, talk about different perspectives and, you know, all things that you can take home and use to solve problems or be more efficient and productive and profitable on your farm or ranch. Several of the uh, industry organizations will be hosting their business meetings at this conference. So like us at the Beef Cattle Research Council, um, you know, talking about funding decisions for uh, upcoming research. Canada Beef, so talking about, you know, how they um, market and promote Canadian beef both domestically and around the world. Uh, the Canadian Cattlemen's Association who lobby on your behalf to uh, 
you know, the federal government, as well as the Young Cattlemen's Council. So they'll all be having their board meetings, and so you can observe these be uh, meetings to kind of better understand how they work on your behalf and um, have the opportunity to give them your input as well. And you're going to have a little bit of fun as well. So we're planning a country music concert one night and a couple of banquets and some good hospitality. Uh, you'll be staying at the Great Eagle Resort and Casino, so you can enjoy all their amenities. And if you're a golfer, you can play in the Canadian Cattlemen's Foundation Classic Golf Tournament to help raise a few dollars for our industry's charitable foundation uh, and meet some new folks in the industry. And if you're going to Calgary, you might as well make a holiday out of it and take in the sights of the city and head a little bit further west and uh, into the mountains. So, save the date, August 9th to 11th, and early bird registrations will open March 1st. If you want to uh, keep up to the updates as they come out, you can search for the Canadian Beef Industry Conference on Facebook. You can follow them on Twitter, or keep an eye on the website, which is www.canadianbeefindustryconference.com, and hopefully we'll see you in August. Sorry about that. Um, we'll move into our first speaker of the evening. I'm pleased to introduce Tom lynch -Staunton. Tom is the Issues Manager for the Canadian Cattlemen's Association, and he will be talking about his position there, so I don't want to spoil anything, so I will let him talk. Okay, um, Stacy. hope you can hear me. Is that okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. And you can see the slides okay now as yeah, well? Yeah, everything's good. Okay, great. Well, um, thanks for having me uh, to the BCRC. Uh, um, I'm just going to give a bit of an overview of, of who I am and, and what my role is at, at uh, CCA as well as a little bit about um, my role with ABP as well. So. Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar. Um, I won't take up too much of your time because uh, I'm sure everybody's very uh, patiently awaiting Reynolds' Reynolds uh, riveting talk that he'll be doing on hormone use in beef cattle. But uh, anyway, so um, my name's Tom Lynch Staunton, and uh, I grew up in the cattle industry. Um, my family has a ranch down in southern Alberta. I worked on that ranch uh, with my brother until 2011, uh, where I took a position at the University of Alberta um, in livestock gen tech, uh, the genomics program here at the U of A. And um, I did that as an industry liaison until just two months ago in August or in October, where um, I took a joint position with Canadian Cattlemen's Association as their issues manager, um, as well as um, with Alberta Beef Producers as a government relations uh, individual here in Edmonton because I'm still able to uh, stay at the office at the U of A. Uh, they've graciously agreed to host me as a business visitor, so that's fantastic. And then while I'm here in Edmonton, ABP thought it would be uh, really beneficial to be able to create better relations um, with um, uh, especially the new Alberta government. But I'll get into my talk. Um, CCA is really a representative of, um, it's, it's really a representative of the primary stakeholders which are the provincial beef producer organizations which in turn represent the 68,000 beef producers in Canada. And so um, uh, my role with CCA is is issues management and of course that seems like quite a broad subject and it, and it is but uh, we do um, we do deal with with a lot of the issues that are out there and how how the position came to be was it was really born out of the uh, Canada's national beef strategy which was created by 
that's the five groups you can see on the screen, uh, CCA, the National Cattle Feeders Association, BCRC, Canada Beef, and the Canadian Beef Breeds Council. And um, when they were developing the national beef strategy, they really saw a need for uh, more more connectivity, um, productivity, competitiveness, competitiveness, and beef demand. And these are really the, the pillars. And where, where the issues management position really fits in is on that connectivity piece. And um, so, so my role is to, is to help these five groups uh, connect more with each other when dealing with uh, any sort of issue, and I'll get I'll get into some of those issues in a moment. But um, uh, it's really uh, trying to coordinate a lot of the messaging between these groups. If if one is dealing with a certain issue, how we can back that other group up, and uh, so that's a lot of what my work will be. And so um, as you can see, it's really a it's really about coordination, collaboration, communication, and messaging along among the the uh, stakeholders. And it's not just um, the stakeholders of those five groups that created the beef strategy, but it's also the provincial organizations, uh, businesses, and producers, and stakeholders in the value chain, government. Academia. Um, now that I'm here, still at the university, I'm able to. If we're dealing with something and we need some some academic expertise, or or if there's research in this area that uh, we can use to back up our story, uh, that's a great connection to have here at the university. Um, as well, um, uh, the international side. Uh, most of the international stuff, of course, will be covered from. Uh, the CCA staff in Ottawa, John Maswell and Brady Stenicki, uh, who do a lot of the work on on the international trade issues, uh, done tremendous work on uh, things like uh, country of origin labeling, as you all know, is is hopefully moving forward um, and getting addressed. Uh, as well, you know, I'll be helping support the communication efforts of the provincial beef producer organizations. Uh, part of it is developing resources and a repository. So when when something comes up, uh, where it's you know a, a company maybe says they're not going to use any uh, meat produced with antibiotics, then we have a repository of information where we can uh, try to educate them and inform them about really why we use antibiotics, for example, um, and and the um, consequences of not having those available, especially in terms of things like animal welfare. Uh, the issues management role is also about maintaining reputation for our beef producers and our industry in general. Uh, it's a little bit about crisis management. We hope to deal with an issue before it ever gets to a crisis, but, but um, hopefully we can develop plans, et cetera, to deal with any sort of crisis or risk that happens. And, uh, and the last point there is to reduce the burden on, on a lot of the current staff. Really, the issues management has been dealt with uh, many staff from, from all the organizations who have done a tremendous job at, at doing this with, with very few resources at hand. I mean, there's really not a lot who work very hard, and, and really my role is to help um, alleviate some of that um, some of that that burden that they have to deal with, try to create a more coordinated effort, and so that um, uh, we can move forward with some extra resource. Um, hopefully, I'm <laughs> I'm able to uh, not get in the way. That will be a, a a thing that I'll have to be conscious of. That's for sure. So the issues management, again, um, another way to look at it is about maintaining social license. And we hear this a lot uh, nowadays. Um, as, we, as we continue on in years uh, and our urban population grows, we're, we're seeing a disconnect between our, our uh, public consumers and, and ranches and um, this disconnect is creating, as 
as Ron Glaser from Canada Beef said, a, a growing unease in the public about where their food comes from. And really, if we can change the perception, change the conversation about what people are starting to hear about things like the environmental impacts of beef uh, is something that we're dealing with, and try to get them feeling good about eating beef and feeling good about where their food comes from. It's, it's really, it's really uh, building part of that story, and a big part of that is building trust and transparency, um, making sure we, we can tell people why we do things a certain way and, and the benefits uh, uh, that happens because we do them. Um, and it's also about justifying why we do these certain production practices. But it's also about recognizing where we may be able to improve those production practices, you know, things like water management or rangeland management, where we can become better stewards of the land or um, take care of uh, our animals that much better. And it's also about being proactive versus reactive. And unfortunately, again, going back to limited sources that, that CCA or BCRC or any of the other groups have, um, we've, we've been reactive on a lot of issues uh, simply because there's just so much to do. And hopefully we can start to, again, build that message repository so that we can get ahead of these issues before they uh, gain momentum and do damage to our industry. And a very good example of that was our was the recent um, IARC um, messaging and announcement uh, with with uh, cancer linkages to meat. And um, there was a great coordinated effort uh, among the various groups. It it worked really well, and and we were able to put that uh, into context, uh, not just with our Canadian groups and Canadian partners, but also uh, with our American counterparts as well. So that was a, we think that was a success. We will have to deal with aftershocks, but um, um, it was relatively quick, quickly um, out of the media. So some of the current issues that we're dealing with. I know that's a very quick and broad overview, and. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to wrap this up very quickly because we'll have to get on to rental, but some of the current issues that we're dealing with, for example, um, we've got uh, things like I said, the environmental impacts, but we have some great resources to, to counteract those arguments and, and really show the benefits of grazing cattle, especially on rangelands. Um, we're hearing a lot about uh, People are worried about antibiotic use and, and antimicrobial resistance. Uh, again, back to the environment, but we've got some great proactive uh, initiatives uh, that we're doing it, it, with regards to things like the environment and antibiotic use. And of course, this leads into uh, hormone use and going into Reynolds' talk. So, so these are some of the current main issues that we're dealing with. Of course, um, like I said, environmental impacts. Uh, it's great that we have um, an environmental manager and the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef for taking the lead on on environmental impacts. And you know, where I can come in is trying to make sure that that if BCRC has some information that can help help their messaging and help. Um, tell their story, that's where we can create some great successes in uh, being proactive. Uh, as I said before, antibiotic use and antimicrobial resistance, we're working very hard to make improvements, understand a lot about um, how this happens. Uh, of course, there's animal welfare concerns uh, from the public and, you know, uh, antibiotic and animal welfare are very tied closely together. Um, and then we've got what Reynold will deal with in a moment, growth hormones and promotants. And I just put in here uh, cool and, and human health. Those are other things that we've been also very active in dealing with. So uh, that gives a quick overview. If, if you do have uh, questions, um, you know, our main media contact at CCA is uh, Gina Teal, and her contact info is right there. You can also contact me as well, and for the Alberta 
producers or people listening, uh, if it's an Alberta related um, uh, issue, you can also contact me uh, uh, through Alberta Beef Producers as well. So there's my contact info and I'll hand it back to you, Stacy. All right, thank you very much for that, Tom. So if anybody has questions for Tom, feel free to type them into the chat window at any time and he will answer them towards the end of the hour here. So with that, I will introduce our next speaker, it will be Dr. Reynold Bergen. Reynold is the Science Director with the Beef Cattle Research Council. In a nutshell, his job is to communicate research to beef producers and explain beef producers to researchers. If you read the Canadian Cattlemen's Magazine, you will um, recognize him from the column that he writes there once a month. Okay, so it's my turn? Sure is. All right. You can see my screen? Yep, everything's good. All right. All right, well, thanks for uh, tuning in, and hopefully we'll uh, have some valuable information here. Now, I don't want to insult anyone's intelligence here. I know most of the people that are watching this webinar are probably producers or ag media or uh, you know involved in the industry in some way or another but what I do want to do is make sure that that maybe there will be some consumers watching this on YouTube at one point and what I want to do is make sure that they understand what we mean by hormone use in beef cattle and so what we don't mean by hormone use in beef cattle is we don't mean that anybody is injecting hormones into beef. Nobody's doing that. We're not talking about hormones being used at the levels that would you know, get an animal into racing condition for the Tour de France. What we're talking about is a very, very small little pellet that is getting implanted between the skin of the ear and the cartilage. So if you feel your ear, you'll feel that it's kind of stiff, right? And that's because of cartilage in there, and you can kind of pinch it so you can feel that there's space in between the skin and the cartilage. And what these implants do is they go in that space and they will dissolve very slowly over time. And as they dissolve, they release a very small amount of whatever hormone is in there and uh, release it to, to contribute to animal growth and efficiency. Now the reason they put these in the ear is because at slaughter, when the animal gets turned into meat, the ear gets thrown away. It doesn't enter the food chain. And so if there did happen to be any uh, residual pellet there, it wouldn't uh, ever find its way into beef. So anyway, most of you who are watching this live already understand this, and thank you for bearing with me. Um, so. The other thing I want to point out is that these things are nothing new. They've been around for a long time, and we're dealing with six products, six different hormones. There's three of them that are natural. One of them is estradiol or estrogen that's been around for about 60 years, and there's some of the, the commercial products that it's found in. There's testosterone that's been around for about 65 years in, in use in cattle. And it's in a couple of different products there too, mostly products intended for, for um, feedlot heifers. There's progesterone in a couple of implants as well. Now each of those has a synthetic version as well. So there's Ralgro or Xeranol is, is actually the, the chemical and it's a, it, it mimics estrogen. There's Trenbolone Acetate, which is the newest one on the block. It's been around for, what's this, uh, 40 years. Um, and it's found in uh, a couple of different products. And it mimics testosterone. And then there's melangesterol acetate, which acts like progesterone. So the main concern, the main issue that we're talking about and that, that Tom would be dealing with would be the health risk that is associated with growth promotants. And that's a pretty easy one to answer. There aren't any. 
but there's a lot of questions around it. And that's why groups like Alberta Beef Producers um, put, spend a lot of time trying to put together communication aimed at the public that will uh, help dis explain what's, what the facts are and, and dispel some of those myths. And ABP put out a, a really well-received brochure not too long ago, earlier this year, that's available on their, on their website and explaining that there's no reason to be uh, nervous about these things. And the reason you don't need to be nervous about them is that, that no matter what kind of human you are, if you're an adult female all the way down to a pre-pubertal pre pre boy, the amount of hormone that you are already producing every single day absolutely dwarfs the amount of residual hormone you would ever get from beef. So prepubertal boy produce so much estrogen on their own that you would have to eat eight entire, he would have to eat eight entire cows worth of beef every single day just to get as much hormone as he's already producing. If you go all the way up to an adult female, she would have to eat 90 five cows worth a day to replace what she's already producing. So so these are negligible, negligible amounts of, of hormone that are that are coming from beef, whether it's implanted or not. So the question is, how do we know they're safe? And what are the facts around this? And and there's a, a really kind of a neat paper, I'm not going to get into huge detail on it, um, but you can read all about it in Cattlemen if you want to, about the, the process they go through to ensure that, that these things don't pose a risk to humans. This is a, a research paper that came out of Korea, but it, it explained the process really well. So what they do is every single vet product, whether it's a hormone or an antibiotic or, you know, a Parasite, parasite treatment or what have you goes through the same thing. The first thing they have to do is they have to prove that it works. They have to prove that it does what they say it's going to do. That if you're um, trying to get a growth promoting registered, that it actually does promote growth. So you have to prove efficacy. Next thing is you have to prove that it's safe, both for the animal you're going to use it in as well as for humans. And so typically they'll do dose response trials in, in various lab animals. And so what that means is they'll take, say, guinea pigs, and they'll give them, some of them, a really tiny dose and some a little bit more, some a little bit more, all the way up to big doses. And they'll see at which dose does something go wrong. Do they start to see mutations or cancer, or reproductive disorders, or nerve problems, development issues, um, immune problems, that kind of thing. So they'll find the first thing that pops up at the lowest dose and then they'll find the next dose lower where nothing happens and that's called the no observed adverse effect level or the null of the first thing that goes wrong and that is if that animal is exposed to that product every single day. Then what they'll do is they'll say well yeah but a guinea pig isn't a human. And not all humans are the same. There's boys, there's girls, there's different sizes, there's mature people and all the rest of it. And so they will say, okay, even though we know that this level had no effect on the most likely problem in guinea pigs, we know that that isn't necessarily going to apply to humans, and so we're going to adjust it for all sorts of safety factors to deal with, with these things. Based on that, they'll decide how much it's safe for a human to be exposed to every single day of their life. So that's this no observed adverse effect level divided by these uncertainty factors. So when it comes to estradiol, estrogen, again, this thing's been around for 60 years. They, uh, and this is a steroid, just about all of these things that I'm talking about are steroid hormones. In, in Normally, in human development, it's involved in the growth and development of the reproductive tract and breasts, especially in women. It's used in human contraceptives, so birth control. It's also used in menopause treatments. And so when they were developed, so this product's been tested like extensively in humans, and it's been used in cattle for 60 years. And so when they were doing this human testing to find out, well, how do we get a product that's effective at dealing with menopause symptoms, what they found in the process of doing that is, is that 300 micrograms of oral, so eaten estradiol pills, 
given to 60 kilogram women every day had absolutely no effect on anything. And so that is your no observed adverse effect level. It's 300 micrograms divided by 60 kilograms every day it gives you 5 micrograms per kilogram per body weight or kilogram body weight per day. Then what they thought was, well, you know what, not all women weigh 60 kilograms and not all, I have to be careful how I say this, not all humans are women and not all women are menopausal and so they adjusted it by a factor of a hundred and said okay well it is perfectly safe to eat up to be exposed to eat up to 50 nanograms per kilogram body weight per day of estrogen estradiol and there will be no impact so we know these things are safe so why the fear because there is a lot of it out there and uh, and uh, if you, sorry, I just uh, realized I skipped my poll questions here, Stacy. So after this slide, I'm going to uh, pause and let you do this first round of poll questions. Is that okay? Yep, that works. Okay, so I'll do one more slide and then we'll do them. Sounds good. Okay, so there, there is fear around about hormones and it's not hard to figure out why. If you Google beef hormones, puberty girls, you find in half a second 150,000 different results that are, that are uh, you know, related to that. So Stacy's going to give you a couple of poll questions just to get a bit of a sense um, from our audience about uh, some hormone related practices on the farm. Perfect. So our first question here, so you can click on the one that best describes you and your answers here are anonymous. So what best describes your operation? Pure better cow calf, cow calf backgrounder, backgrounder finisher, and just finisher. So select the one that most applies to you. Give you a couple more seconds here. All right. So it looks like about 61% of our audience today are purebred or cow-calf producers, about 32% are cow-calf and backgrounders, and 7% are backgrounders and finishers. So the next question here, so do you implant your steer calves? So the um, answer here, either yes or no, so just click the one that applies. Right, I'll give you a few more seconds. And there we go. So about 70% of producers on the webinar today do not, and about 23% do. And did you want the last one as well, Reynold? Um, sure, I can't remember what it is, but why don't we? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. So on a scale of one to five, how concerned are you about the safety of growth promotants? So one is not worried at all, and five is very worried. So if you select the answer that applies most to you. Once again, I'll give you a couple more seconds to get your answers in here. All right. So it looks like the majority of our audience, um, about 56%, are not worried at all, um, whereas 3% are very worried, um, and then the others fall in between. All right, so back hey. to you, Reynold. All right, with that brief interruption, the Western Canadian Cow-Calf Survey that was done um, by Western Beef Development Center um, involving a couple of different provinces a few months ago, I believe what they found was that about a third of cow-calf producers typically implant um, on a regular basis, so that's not too different than uh, what we're seeing here tonight. And so what I want to do with the rest of this webinar is assure that 65% of you that agreed that they had no concerns about this, that you're right to feel that way. Hopefully we can get that 3% that are very concerned reduced a little bit. Anyway, where did I leave you here? I was talking about um, the, the fear you see on the internet around the use of hormonal beef um, potentially being linked to uh, premature onset of puberty in young girls. So I clicked on one of these, I think it was the very first one actually, and I found this article. 
from the natural news, hormones in meat cause young girls to reach puberty sooner. And they refer in here to a research paper that was done in, in the University of Brighton and published in the journal called Public Health Nutrition. And so I saw this and I thought, wow, they're referring to research here. And I'm a nerd, so I am going to go look at that research. And so I found it. This was research done in England, and it was a paper called Diet Throughout Childhood and Age at Menarche, which is first menstruation in a contemporary cohort of British girls. And so what they did in this uh, study was they took a bunch of young girls, like from even before they were born. So they, it was a prospective study, and so they started studying pregnant women and then tracked their daughters' um, dietary patterns and and a you know bunch of stuff like weight and and when did they you know reach maturity and all the rest of it over a period of time. And these girls they were born in the early 90s. So I read this thing and and I started to wonder a little bit about this as soon as I started to read this because it occurred to me that the United Kingdom joined the European Union in 1973 and the EU banned the use of growth promotants in 1989 and the girls that were used in this or used um, involved in this study were born starting in 1991-92 and so I started to wonder well okay how did they find any kind of connection with growth promotants and they didn't if you actually read this paper from cover to cover which I did they never mentioned beef and they didn't even mention red meat they were just talking about meat and that paper made absolutely no reference to hormonal growth promotants at all what they did say in this paper is that it would make sense from an evolutionary standpoint that a diet that includes meat and or animal protein would would um, promote sexual maturity and the reason for that is that meat is a really really good source of things like zinc and iron which are have a high requirement during pregnancy so the idea is that if you've got a meat rich diet that means that you've probably got a pretty good physiological level of zinc and iron and so if you've got if you meet those requirements it's telling the body that you're good to go you're good to reproduce and that happens sooner so there you go but what was the title of this thing the title was hormones in meat cause young girls to reach puberty sooner the research that they were referring to didn't say that at all and in fact in this in this article in fairness to them they did say that the effect of meat was largely due to improved nutrition and they say here's the good things in meat but in the very next paragraph what they said was another factor believed to be responsible for earlier puberty is the presence of endocrine hormone disrupting chemicals in the environment so the paper that they were sort of hinting that this came from didn't actually say that so you got to be kind of careful about not believing everything you see on the internet in case you didn't know anyway I'm gonna move on to um, that was really good science that was being really really warped by someone who had an agenda but there's bad science out there too there's fantasy science and everybody knows that every good fantasy is rooted in hormones and here's another one this is a relatively new paper this came out in 2015 and it was called hormone use in food animal production assessing potential dietary exposures and breast cancer risk and so what these guys did was they injected rats and mice with these hormones these are all used as growth promotants in cattle so they injected rats and mice with these hormones at these levels and they saw all sorts of things go wrong a lot of them related to breast cancer right? we got teat abnormalities mammary growth um, increased mammary development so that's kind of alarming but what they didn't tell you in this paper is that these doses they were using whoops were somewhere between a hundred and 80,000 times that acceptable daily intake that I explained earlier on. 
So to put this in another con uh, context, I'm going to take the lowest and the highest number here. What in order to get this level of exposure through your diet, that would be somewhere between th over 300 servings of beef daily up to 13,300 servings of beef daily. And so, you know, what was the title of this? The title of this was Assessing Potential Dietary Exposures. And really, there's no, there is nothing potential dietary exposure about this. And uh, I mean, that's a to me a joke that's worthy of Monty Python. So anyway, not all science is good either. Keep that in mind. Um, so now you can, some of these growth promotants that we use in cattle are also abused in people. You can go to steroid.com and you can order Trenbolone. So this is one of our growth promotants used in cattle. It pretends to be, it acts like testosterone and you can order it off the internet and they ship without a prescription. So there you go. Now this is used as a growth promotant in beef cattle. It's used in feedlots um, at a dose of 200 milligrams. So I was telling you earlier on that one one set of pellets for one of these implants going in the ear would contain a total of 200 milligrams of Trenbolone, um, 20 milligrams of estradiol. That implant would last a feedlot steer like this 120 days. So 200 milligrams would keep these things growing and converting feed efficiently um, for, for 120 days. Now this is Tom, he's our new issues manager. You heard from him earlier and he actually gave me this idea, but I don't think he intended it this way. If, if we were to use this implant, like you can get over the internet, to turn Tom into this, one implant wouldn't work. We couldn't just implant him and have him grow like this for 120 days. If we wanted to turn Tom into this, we'd have to implant him every other day. Because on that website, they give you instructions on how to use this stuff. And they say that, it, you know, you probably start at 100 milligrams every other day, so half a pellet every other day. But you pretty soon you'll get up to a pellet every other day, so two, 100 milligrams every day, so one implant every other day. So if you want to, you know, use this as a, a human performance enhancing drug, you know, treating yourself like an animal isn't going to do it. You got to really overdose it. Now, in in the interest of public safety, they do um, show that 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 you know, if you are taking as much trenbolone every day as it takes to, to finish a feedlot steer, you might have some side effects. And those uh, those range from things like water retention to man boobs and baldness and excess body hair, low good cholesterol, high bad cholesterol, high blood pressure. Lots of bad things can happen if you take as much as a steer needs for a, a four month period. If you take that every other day, there's going to be problems. And there's probably no real surprise there um, because reputable doctors have said for a long, long time, and I think Keith Richards would probably agree with them, that the dose determines the poison and no one should consume 5,000 times too much of anything because there could be long-term side effects. Um, so we've been talking about hormones in beef. But there's other ways you can get hormones from your diet too. This is research that came out of Wisconsin, um, and and it was kind of a neat neat paper. I didn't realize just how many things you're exposed to every day. So they give you a list of, of various uh, foods that in, contain hormones. And the thing that was news to me was, and well, this one actually wasn't a surprise. A lot of plants contain other horm uh, compounds with estrogenic activity, so those are called phytoestrogens. And and so you you hear the comment sometimes that the bun has more hormone than the burger, and that's probably true. Um, milk contains hormones as well, completely naturally. Fish contains hormones as well, and they can make a 
contribution to your dietary exposure to these things. So there's other dietary sources of hormones in, in the foods you eat every day. And some of them contain a lot more hormones than beef. But there's absolutely no reason to worry about those either. And here's why. There's this concept called oral bioavailability. And so what that means is that, that if you eat hormones, it's not as effective as if you inject them. So if you eat hormones, only a tiny fraction ever reaches the tissue, only 5 to 10% of it. And the other 90 to 95% get broken down and inactivated in the, in the digestive tract and the liver and gets broken down and, and never reaches your, your tissues. So that's why um, the uh, bodybuilders inject them still for this stuff rather than eating, eating implants. Um, oh, so what's this? This is a paper that came out of North Dakota not too long ago, and I, I did a Cattleman article on this recently, so this hopefully, if you read that, it might sound familiar. Um, it was a paper that, that was talking about if you it, it exposed young pigs to beef that was produced from implanted cattle, did that affect when they reached puberty? Um, and so what, what they did was they, they took uh, 24 young pigs that were like two months of age and the reason they use pigs is that pigs, you, you can't do this kind of research in humans, at least not in North America anymore, um, but you can use pigs. And pigs are really, really similar to humans in numerous ways, but especially um, the, their anatomy and their physiology. So their the way their body's put together and the way their body works is really, really similar to humans. So they took these young pigs, pigs, they fed them four different diets. One of them was just a base diet that was corn and canola meal. They used canola meal as a protein supplement, and they used that because canola has really pretty low levels of phytoestrogens. They fed a positive control, which was this diet, plus a 200-gram tofu burger every day. So tofu is made from soy, and the reason they use this is that soy has and tofu have really high levels of phytoestrogens. They fed a natural diet, so that's this one again, plus a quarter-pound burger from a non-implanted steer every day, and then again the same diet, the control diet, plus a quarter-pounder from steers that had been implanted with trenbolone, like a Revolor type implanted implant. So they fed it, fed this diet um, up till, you know, after they'd reached puberty. They watched them every day to see when they came into puberty. They bled them twice a week to analyze hormones. They, after everybody had reached puberty, they, they killed them all and, and took lots of reproductive tract measurements. And here's what they found. When they analyzed the diets, they found that there was no difference between the control diet, the, just the corn and canola meal, and the natural diet, so the, the, the natural burger, the unimplanted burger, the implanted burger, they all had really low levels of estrogen activity in them. The tofu burger diet had really high levels of estrogen activity, and that's because of these phytoestrogens, way higher than the other ones, actually. But even though there was a difference in the level of estrogen in the diet, there was no difference in when those pigs came into puberty. And that goes back to that whole bioavailability thing, right? When you eat hormones, most of them, 95% like of them get broken down, and so they never reach the body. They never have an effect on, on your physiology, and in this case, they had no effect on when those pigs came into puberty. Um, when they looked at the reproductive tracts, they saw no difference in the weight of the reproductive tract and the weight of the ovaries. They saw no diet effects on body weight, on muscling, on fatness, on serum progesterone levels, on serum estrogen levels. Again, that's another indication that, that the, the digestive system is breaking these things down. They're not reaching the bloodstream. They're not reaching the body. They're not having any effect. And their conclusion was that these pigs could eat a quarter pounder every single day from early, early in life all the way up to post-puberty, and they're not going to hit puberty any faster. And pigs are very similar to people, and so this same thing is, happens with, is, is true for, for girls as well. 
so the point here is beef is a really great way to get a lot of nutrients like zinc and iron and protein. It's a really, really lousy source of hormones. Um, but there's other reasons we use these things and, and you know, obviously to make help cattle grow faster and, and more efficiently and, and improve car. There's benefits for the environment too. Um, if we were to throw out all the technology that we use in beef production today, we'd need, just to produce the same amount of beef we have now, we'd need 12% more cattle, we'd need more land to grow them on, we'd need more feed, because our feed efficiency would be down, we'd need more water, we'd need to use more fuel, we'd produce more greenhouse gases and manure, and beef would be more expensive to produce, so retail prices would go up too. So, there's environmental benefits. These benefits, though, are already being quest questioned. Like, I think we've put the, hopefully, um, presented pretty compelling evidence that these things are safe for people, but now there's uh, questions being raised about whether these things are safe for the environment, and this environmental concern is around endocrine disruptors. And those are, I mentioned those earlier, those are just chemicals um, that interfere with hormone systems, and, and they're real, it happens. Um, there was uh, some research published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science a while ago that talked about atrazine, which is a corn chemical for weed control, um, how it can induce sex changes in male African clawed frogs. And I don't know what level that that happens with, whether those are levels that would ever um, be realistic exposure in the nat natural environment, I don't know. But the reason this is important is because this very chemical, as a result of this kind of thing, has come under fire in Quebec. So uh, when was this? September of this very year, there's been a group in Quebec calling for a ban on that um, herbicide because of the the concerns around its use. Now, this thing about the endocrine disruptors, a lot of that concern goes back to research done about 20 years ago, and there was some research done back then that um, it, what they did was they, they, they well, the paper, the, what they found was that you can f um, have an estrogenic compound that has no activity at really low levels, and you can have another one that has no effect at really low levels. But if you put those two really low levels together, things can go really haywire, is what this research paper said. They got it published. And by God, did that set the world on fire when that came out. And and so there, that's what I just explained. Um, two really small numbers had a really big impact, is what they said. And Boy, did everybody get excited about this. And this was was re, um, referred to everywhere. There were lots of papers, research papers, that were talking about this and, and, uh, and you know, raising the alarm bells about how this sort of thing was a serious uh, threat to everybody. So we used to be worried about high levels. What this thing is saying is that really, really low levels could be just as bad. But then that paper got withdrawn because it turned out that nobody could make those results happen again when they tried to repeat the study. And so this paper still gets cited on occasion. Um, sometimes people still take it seriously even though it's been withdrawn. Sometimes it's used as a cautionary tale of why people shouldn't make up their results. But the problem is that when you have bad science like this, or the one that I referred to earlier, um, stuff like that causes people to doubt the good science too, and so that's the real problem here. Um, so anyway, there's kind of a list of the, the various papers that have been referring to using it. So anyway, these concerns around the en environmental uh, endocrine disruptors, those are coming for our growth promotants too. There was a paper um, research done out of the states looking at trenbolone about Revelor and unrecognized risks for for uh, you know endocrine disruption. The same group has done two different papers on it. I've read them both. Um, in in a nutshell, what these were lab studies, and really what they said was is that if you take raw manure from implanted cattle and you put it in a pool of warm acid in the dark, these hormone residues don't break down as fast. And that may well be the case, but 
it, there's no evidence from these papers that there's an actual environmental concern under realistic commercial conditions, right? So just because something happens in the lab under, you know, artificial conditions doesn't mean the same thing's going to happen in real life. So, um, but the problem is when stuff like that gets out there, it gets picked up in the media and that is out there, right? The, the common hormone used to fatten up cows is contaminating the environment. This is from earlier this year. There's a real appetite for flashy stories like that. So what does that mean? It means that we need valid research done in real world conditions to provide an accurate perspective on whether this thing can actually is, is a real risk or not. And we are trying to get that information. So um, when I first read those two papers, I didn't know what to make of them. And so I sent them to Tim McAllister, who's an Ag Canada researcher in Lethbridge, and I because he's kind of my go-to guy for a lot of questions. And I said, Tim, what does this mean? He says, I don't know. I'll get back to you. And I didn't hear from him for about a week. And then he uh, phoned me and he said, okay, here's what we're going to do. He said, you know how we've got this big antimicrobial resistance project going on through the beef cluster where we're collecting samples from feedlots and we're analyzing antimicrobial resistance genes and residues in manure and seeing how composting and stockpiling affects it. And we're looking at antimicrobial resistance in the soil and in water and how it might flow into municipal drinking water. We're doing all this with these antimicrobial resistance um, samples in in commercial feedlots said we've got the samples already we're going to analyze them for these hormone residues and breakdown products too and so so that um, research is going on um, so it's kind of built on this beef cluster project we've got but he's also managed to um, procure a, a considerable research support from Alma to to get the hormone side of it done too so so that's um, that's pretty exciting um, and so we were really, really fortunate that we were able to add that hormone component onto this project, and we could do that this time. Um, you know, and, and that's important because historically the BCRC has has focused our research on production research, on stuff that'll that'll save producers money or make the industry more money. We've focused on production research, but as Tom indicated in his presentation public concerns and issues management takes up an increasing amount of our time now. So we need to, to, uh, to be able to have the information to answer those questions. And even from a, a government research point of view, there's a, a increased expectation that, that if industry wants that kind of research to go on, they had better step up and help pay for it too. We used to view this thing, this sort of question, environmental stuff, food safety stuff, we would view that as public good. That 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 is stuff that the public is concerned about, so the public dollars should pay for it. But it, you know the way things are working now is is that if we want that research to be done, it's only going to happen if we're supporting it. So that applies to food safety stuff, environmental stuff, animal welfare, all those sorts of things that we used to take for granted that the government would do. Now we need to step up as a funding partner. And it's important that we do that because these things are very directly related to industry confidence and, you know, and if we want answers to these questions, that's going to require more research and that will require more research funding. Um, uh, the last webinar, the one before, I think it was the one before, Andrea talked um, about the beef strategy. That was the pain mitigation um, webinar that uh, John Campbell did. She explained this whole beef strategy. And what this is about is building the case to get more, increase the national checkoff so that we could could fund this bigger mandate that's that we're sort of inheriting as the government um, expects industry to, to, to step up with these things. So through this national strategy, we are asking for 50 cents out of the proposed dollar fifty increase, that fifty cents we would put towards just continuing what we're doing now. We would um, be making investments to train new researchers and to get them hired. We would be doing um, getting more actively involved in surveillance around things like antimicrobial resistance, some of these environmental things I talked about, animal health. Um, more active involvement and extension than we are now. Um, work to support the, the claims we make around the, the benefits of Canadian beef, 
and long-term support for the national on-farm food safety, and then something we've called a domestic and international research liaison. So the, the reason I'm going to mention this one in particular is that we aren't the only country that does beef research and you aren't the only producers that fund beef research. There's stuff that's going on everywhere. And in this talk I talked about research done in Korea, in Wisconsin, in Britain, and in uh, North Dakota. So this stuff is going on elsewhere and if we can identify what's going on elsewhere then, then we don't need to repeat it necessarily, and we can build on it, and we can share our results with them too, because a lot of this crosses boundaries. And, and what's interesting is there's a, a real appetite for this stuff, because the reason I put this presentation together in the first place was that the International Meat Secretariat met in Calgary earlier this year, and they wanted a presentation on the safety of growth promotants. This is the International Meat Secretariat. I was I was kind of surprised that, that there wasn't somebody who'd already put this kind of thing together for them. But, but anyway, I, I, the point here is that, that we can be, uh, benefit, we can gain from other people's knowledge, they can benefit from ours. Anyway, we fund great research. We do a good job, I hope, um, of turning that research results into information that, that benefits our industry. We could do more, and we want to do more, but we're going to be hard-pressed to keep doing what we're doing, let alone do more, without an increase in the national checkoff that, that I just ran over and that, that uh, Andrea talked about earlier. So anyway, that's the end of my presentation, and if we have questions, if we have time for questions, we can uh, deal with them now. Perfect. All right. Thanks, Reynold. So um, we do have a couple more minutes here for questions. So if you do have questions for either Tom or Reynold, you can type them into the chat box on the side of your screen there. And Tom, I'll just get you to turn on your webcam and your mic as well. There, there we go. go. I'm still here. Fantastic. In a week. All right. So oh, we yeah. do have where'd, one where'd question. Where did you get that, that photo from me? <laughs> the internet's a magical place, Tom. Huh? <laughs> I thought my wife might have sent it to you. <laughs> <laughs> so we did have a couple questions sent in beforehand. So the first one for Reynold. Um, Reynold, what about beta agonists? What about them? What about um, the use of beta agonists? Uh, no, I, I, <laughs> so I didn't talk about beta agonists in this in this talk. Beta, and the reason I didn't was that I was focusing on hormones. Beta agonists are another type of, of growth promotant, but they aren't hormones. Um, what they are is a feed additive, and they're used late in the feeding period because they're really good at, at improving feed efficiency. Um, it, at the point in the animal's growth curve when, when, when growth slows down, feed efficiency slows down, this maintains that going for a little bit longer. Um, they're really, really effective um, and uh, they're used when it when it makes sense. Um, they're they're used in human medicine as well. These beta agonists are used as an asthma treatment, and so the human safety of those things has been really um, extensively tested for a long time. And and yeah, there's no concerns around that. Um, the the human there. Sometimes you'll hear about beta agonists in a negative context because there's some countries where where growth promotants are banned, and so they'll use a beta agonist called clenbuterol illegally in the feed to get these um, these growth effects. Now, clenbuterol is a different kind of beta agonist. The ones that we use in cattle are water soluble. Not what that means is that they have an effect, but the wa muscle water is mostly found in muscle, and muscle uh, turns over really fast, and so they leave the system really quickly. The clenbuterol is fat soluble, and fat is a storage energy storage mechanism for the body, and so it, that clenbuterol residues can build up there. That's why they're banned for use in food animals in Canada and the U.S. But there's some other places where they they are still still used. So so uh, the ones that we use here are 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 safe, and and uh, I guess there's been there's been some some 
questions around whether they impact animal welfare, and I'm not going to get into the details of that one, but but there's, I saw a webinar last week, there's a guy named Dan Thompson at a Kansas State University who has studied the we potential welfare impacts of beta agonists in, in feedlot cattle really, really extensively, and there's nothing to see here, folks. It's it's about how animals are managed and how they're handled, low stress handling. It's not about, it's not about beta agonists. All right. Thanks. Sorry, I don't give short answers. <laughs> no problem. Um, so if you do have any more questions, once again, you can just type them in the chat box on the side of your screen. If the um, control panel has disappeared on you throughout the webinar, there should be a little orange arrow you can click and that will expand it again. So we have another question here for Tom. So um, Reynolds talked a lot about consumer um, concern about safety of hormones. How do you deal with that from an issues management standpoint? Um, well, Stacy, it's uh, again, it's a, it's about um, hopefully communicating that message that you know Reynolds did a fantastic job about communicating that message, being transparent that yes, we are using these products uh, when raising cattle. Um, and building that trust and transparency back, especially when dealing with consumers. Um, we have to not be afraid to tell those stories. And as well, we, we also have to uh, make sure that, that we're as truthful and transparent as possible. So from an issues management perspective, if, if we had consumer concerns and they're coming to one of the groups uh, you know, that I mentioned, either a provincial uh, producer association like a ABP or um, or even if it was Canada Beef for BCRC um, then what we would do is say okay well who should handle this the best probably BCRC since you know um, obviously Reynolds has most of the information already gathered and then he can communicate that message or um, bring in a few spokespeople people uh, other stakeholders that can uh, get debriefed by Reynolds and then start to communicate that message that much better. But, um, you know, a lot of this communication, it, it really is not just one or two people. It is definitely a group effort. And um, it's, uh, and it's not just us in the organizations, it's also producers have an opportunity to communicate this as well, whether that's one-on-one -on -one or even through things like social media. All right, thanks very much, Tom. So another question here for Reynold. Could you talk about the effects of hormone on meat quality, so in terms of tenderness and marbling? The, um, so what, what growth prom promotants do is, is they encourage um, muscle growth and they kind of discourage fat growth. A uh, little bit, maybe, um, but and and the other thing they can do is lead to an increase in uh, connective tissue in the muscle, and and they can make it tougher. Where that'll happen is if it's a really aggressive implant program on the wrong kind of cattle, and so you know if you're if you have questions about this, talk to your pharmaceutical person because they've got the uh, you know they 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 deal with the, enough. Uh, clients that, that they understand where, where these things are recommended and where they're not. Um, but it, if, if so the question around tenderness, it can impact tenderness, but if they're used appropriately, so if just a, you know, if they're used as recommended in the right kind of cattle, you will see statistically tougher meat in implanted cattle, but statistically significant doesn't always mean um, practically meaningful. And so the differences that you can find in the lab with a with a shear force machine are way more sensitive than the average consumer can detect when they're eating it. So you might find differences in the lab, but they might not. They're, they're probably way too. The differences are probably way too small for the average person to detect. All right, thank you very much. Um, so just a follow-up question for that. So um, how do you know then if they are making tougher beef? How do I know if they are? Well, the way, um, 
what, what I would point to is that another one of our cluster initiatives is a beef quality audit that we do on a periodic basis. Um, we're just in the middle of our fourth one right now. And so that beef quality audit, if you think, if you remember back, the Quality Starts Here program, where they, which was the, the initiative that, that started to tell producers don't give injections in the hind quarter, give them in the, in the neck instead, because that's what the cheaper cuts are. That kind of advice grew out of the first beef quality audit. So that's just history. Um, but we do these beef quality audits, and part of that beef quality audit involves collecting um, beef samples from different cuts um, at retail stores, so the same same beef that, that I would buy. Um, and they do two things with it. They take send some of them for lab, lab analyses. They also get consumers to um, rate their their thoughts on tenderness. And they've, they've been monitoring changes in tenderness over time with these different beef quality audits. And what the, the current one's underway now, so I don't know what the results are. But what I can say is that when we did the last one in about 2010, tenderness evaluations both on the lab side as well as the consumer, consumer side said that, that beef was every bit as tender as it was 10 years earlier, and maybe it was even a little bit better. And so what that tells me is, is that, that the use of more aggressive implant programs has not negatively affected consumers' perception of beef. Okay, thanks, Reynold. So another question here for Tom before we wrap things up. So um, certain fast food restaurants or um, retailers advertise um, meat I, or beef, I guess, in a negative light, how can they do that? Does that make sense to you? <laughs> so the question, so how do, how do retailers advertise meat in a negative light? Yeah, so um, marketing like, campaigns that... So why they're doing it or um, I guess how they're able, how to, they're do able to do that? Um, <laughs> I guess um, they're able to do it because um, they probably, unfortunately, don't have all the information. Um, so if we talk about a retailer and, you know, um, advertising hormone-free beef, for example, um, you know, the, the, from the retailer's point of view, they're looking for increasing market share, more sales, and, and looking at ways that they can do that. They know that consumers, that, that hormone use, for example, is a concern with, with the public who haven't seen Reynolds' webinar. So, um, you know, they're going to try to, to fill that niche uh, so that they can sell more product. And that's, that's essentially what they're doing. And, and so, from our perspective, to try to deal with this is if we know that the retailers are thinking about going down this road, it's really important that we're able to get in front of them, have a conversation about, well, let's, let's talk about what this really means. And if, you know, there are some retailers that are talking about um, antibiotic-free uh, beef, and unfortunately, that that could create animal welfare issues if we're not allowed to treat sick animals. So just saying that to a, to a retailer that's thinking that, um, when they don't understand the whole story or why we use them, and it's not just that we want to use them, you know, pump things full of antibiotics, that's, there's no intention to do that. It's to, it's to prevent sickness and disease, and that's a huge animal welfare issue. So means that us um, and our groups, uh, Canada Beef would be great to be able to talk to retailers and explain the story with us giving that key message to uh, messages to back up why things like hormones are safe, why they're used, why antibiotics are used for animal welfare, etc. So I hope that answered your question. Yes, it did. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so that's about it for uh, questions tonight. So I just have a few more things before I let everyone go here. So one is how to get more information and science-based production advice through the BCRC. You can go to our website, beefresearch.ca. 
and click the subscribe button and sign up for our free email list. If you have a Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube account, you can connect with us on there as well. I would also encourage you to visit the Canadian Cattlemen's Association website, cattle.ca, where you can sign up for their free newsletter called Action News. So as soon as the webinar ends tonight, you'll be asked to complete a short survey that asks about tonight's session and what you're most interested in for future webinar topics. We do need your feedback to do the best job that we can to deliver information to you that's both useful and meaningful and helps you make informed decisions on your operation. So please do complete the survey for us and don't hesitate to contact me with questions, comments or suggestions at any time. So with that, I would like to thank every, uh, Reynolds and Tom for volunteering their time and expertise tonight, and good night. Thank you.